Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us Need Software to 213-640-9738. That's 213-640-9738. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal Buyer's Protection Guarantee. Just when you thought it was safe to submit an idea to your employer, hold on. Before you do, read The Anatomy of a Corporate Lynching, Updated Edition, and Avoid the Great White Sharks. Available on Amazon Worldwide. And hear the audiobook featuring a cast of actors delivering the facts exclusively at fourthfordbooks.com. Racism is the most powerful system on the planet, yet it is often perceived as the most taboo subject to discuss. World renowned activist and best selling author Tariq Nasheed takes on this challenge head on in his new book, Foundational Black American Race Baiter. This is the most important book you will need in order to understand the mechanisms of systemic racism and how to counter this system. Get Foundational Black American Race Baiter now at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also get limited autographed collector's editions of the book at OfficialFBA.com. guys welcome to another episode of Tariq radio i am your gracious host Tariq nasheed glad to have everybody tuning in we're gonna chop up some very good game on today's broadcast we're gonna do some motivational game today ladies and gentlemen the summertime is almost here we got to get the the black family motivated out here especially the fba family we got to do some motivation out here ladies and gentlemen so y'all don't move a muscle. I'm going to need you to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell notification so that you can be notified whenever we go live right here on Tariq Radio. I want y'all to retweet this, repost this on your Facebook. Let everybody know we're live right now. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we will be right back. You don't want to move a muscle. We'll be right back right here on Tariq Radio. Listen up, squares. You need to get the legendary book on game, The Art of Mackin. By author Tariq King Flex Nasheed. Available on Amazon right now. Can you dig it? This book has been a bestseller for 20 years, Jack. And the New York Times called it a classic. That means it's out of sight. So this book ain't for no lames who ain't trying to learn the game. Jive turkeys. So if you're ready to stop slacking in your mackin'. Get the Art of Mac and Book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble right now. Sucker. Rated PG. That stands for plenty of game. Jive chumps. Are you looking to start your own business? Millions of brothers have turned to eBay to escape the rat race. Become your own boss and get the Power Seller Research eBook. It's a comprehensive, step-by-step -step guide that explains how to start an eBay business. The website is PowerSellerResearch.com. Again, that's PowerSellerResearch.com. What's up, family? Check out DebudMarketing.com. Do you know the CARES Act administered by the IRS currently has tax credits, that means cash, available for businesses that were hurt by the pandemic? during 2020 and 21 if you had five w2 employees and were shut down you probably qualify check out 
debudmarketing.com and fill out a five minute questionnaire. That's D E B U D D marketing.com. Yo, shop at oxywellness.com to experience the natural benefits of what CBD can do for you, your health, and your well being. Their CBD brand called Oxygen has a THC-friendly product line that addresses several ailments like pain, inflammation, stress, and much more. You can also get in on the distribution side of the game by getting involved in launching your own CBD franchise. So get with them right now at OxyWellness.com. That's O-X-Z-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S.com. Check out Divine Essential Minerals right now. Divine Essential Minerals is a black-owned vitamins and minerals supplement business that offers a variety of high-quality vitamins and minerals in capsule form. Capsules such as sea moss infused with bladder rack, burdock root, elderberry, lion's mane, dandelion root, and many, many more. Use the coupon code Tariq15 to get 15% off at checkout. Invest in your health care and your self-care right now by going to DivineEMinerals.com. Again, that's DivineEMinerals.com. Bro, stop playing and start spraying. Leave an op on the ground where you stand. At all costs, yeah, make sure you protect it. Oh, goon juice, the formula been tested. You can defend yourself. If you find that you need a little help, gotta stay ready. Ain't no love in the street. Pepper spray straight to the face, make them get weak. Get it at ogoonjuice.com. If they thinking you slipping, then tell them to come get them some. If you packing this, you won't be lacking. But shot to the eye in them problems you having. Maximal strip hit them haters on ground. So you can feel free when you out in the town. Ogoon juice and don't forget a shirt, man. You gotta stay ready. That evil on lurk. Yeah. Let's get down to it. You are now tuned in to the Godfather of the game. Often imitated and always celebrated. Stop sloganary. Sloganary kills people. Hey yo, check this out. It's Tyreek Nasheed on Tyreek Radio. Let's go. Let's go. Be my goddamn summerlow. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. We are back. We are back. How y'all doing today, man? We're doing our thing. Boy, it's been a busy week for us, man. Very, very busy week. I hope you guys checked out some of my um, Twitter space uploads here on the channel. Had a great debate with a, a suspected WS. So you guys need to check that out. I uploaded that last night. Very good broadcast. When I do these debates with these suspecteds, these are master classes that you need to study. We need to study and learn how to deal with the deception and the manipulation of some of these people. All right, y'all really got to study these things so we can know how to deal with them. All right. Man, there's a lot we got going on. Let me say this. Um, we got we got some good news on the museum, by the way, family. That's a, another thing we've been working on all week. We finally got a location that's cooperating because we've been finding different locations out here in LA. The problem was to get the people to cooperate correctly. We would get a we get a spot and everything would be good and then all of a sudden they would kind of renege and they would just kind of dip out and they would not return calls. So we would kind of get in the runaround with a lot of different properties, but we found a place out here in LA. The place is actually on Jefferson. It's over on that side of the town. It's still in South LA, but it's on Jefferson. Real good spot. It's over close by Harold and Bells. I don't want to say the exact location yet, but my LA people, y'all know where Harold and, I think that's the name of the soul food restaurant, Harold and Bells on um, Jefferson. It's kind of close by there, over there in that area. And everything is looking good so far. We gave, put our offer in. They gave us a counter offer. That was very good. The counter offer, they weren't all over the top. So the counter offer is a very good rate. The building looks good. We don't have to do a lot of renovation to the building, which is good. I think it's already coded. The the, the street, uh, the, the city codes are already coded for it to be an art gallery or um, an art place. I think they it was some kind of art gallery before. So it's already, it already has the city codes ready. So this is a good ass deal we about to get. And we're doing the escrow document signing now. I've been doing that all day. We've been going back and forth signing documents. And so it's looking good. Yeah, let me, I'm gonna seal the deal first. 
I want to make sure I, I feel comfortable when, I, when the keys are in my hand. I'll say that. When the keys are in my hand, then I'm feeling real good. So right now I'm saying we're getting some real good cooperation. All right. We're getting some real good cooperation. So, yeah, you guys are going to love it. We're going to make this thing pop off. So it's looking good right now. It's looking very, very good right now. All right. So I'm going to keep people posted on the next couple of days. But um, anyway, man, let's let's get into some stuff today, man. Let's get into some talk today. Uh, later on in the broadcast, I'm going to talk about 10 strategies to success. I want us to get a success mindset. I want to start having us understand how to not be manipulated by those in the dominant society, how we can stay on top of our game so we can be mentally empowered. Once we're mentally empowered, we'll start physically empowering ourselves. The name of the game is to not be manipulated because people try to manipulate us all the time. And we are disempowered because of that. You understand? But before I get into that, a few things I want to touch on. Um, right now, we know what happened out there in Buffalo. There's a lot of splaining and stuff going on. What I don't like, you have a lot of people in the political realm sitting here trying to do all of these symbolic gestures. We as foundational black Americans, ladies and gentlemen, we need not only reparations, cash resources, we need a Marshall plan to a certain degree, but we also need an anti black hate crime bill. We really need to start using the words we need an anti-black hate crime bill that gives us protection as black people, foundation of black Americans in particular, because when Asians were aggrieved, there were immediately crime bills available for them. There were crime bills for them. And there was resources for them. Now, when our black people, our black family, they were attacked up there in Buffalo. The white Democrats had their plantation flunkies get out here in the media and start talking all of this all lives matter stuff, trying to include all of these other groups. We have to call that out. Family, that's a, that's a trick and a strategy to undermine us. We cannot allow these people to all lives matter us when we are aggrieved. When we are being specifically targeted, don't come around us talking about, well, we got to help everybody. Everybody is aggrieved because that's a way to undermine us. See, when they want to punish black folks, they don't bring in other groups. When it's time to hit us with a damn RICO statute, it's those black folks, black on black crime. What's wrong with the black community? It's all black when it's negative, when it's something negative and they want to punish people. Will black folks be doing this? Black, black, it's black all day. But when it's time to compensate and protect people, especially us, when it's time to help us, all of a sudden, well, Asians get hurt too and Hispanics and we can't leave out Eskimos. No. We do not play that game and we don't allow them to play that game with us, ladies and gentlemen. Now, right now, they're doing a press conference live. I want, let me tune into the live press conference. They got Al Sharpton on here. His perm is fluttering in the wind. Oh, God. I, uh, let me see what they're talking about on this press conference, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on. They're doing a live press conference out there in Buffalo. They got Al Sharpton out here. The wind has, has knocked his perm loose. His they out there with the family. They got Crump out there. Oh, Lord. Okay. Uh, uh, they just ended it. Okay. I don't even know what's being said, but I can tell it was butter biscuit crumbs flying. I, uh, did they say anything about a, an anti-black hate crime bill? Because Sharpton was on one program. Hold on. Where's that program Sharpton was on? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? He was on Morning Joe. Where's that? clip? Right here. Let me play this clip on Meet the Press. And let me play the clip of Sharpton. And by the way, Sharpton's words, his white paymasters are making him say this stuff. So I'm not going to beat up on him too much, but I'm going to beat up on him. Because you ain't got to go along with the damn program. But here's Sharpton. They're talking about what happened in Buffalo. All right. 
and then they start all lives mattering everything. Hold on one second. Let me let me play that clip real quick. Let me get the audio together here. Hold on one second. Hold on. Hold on. Let me play it. Uh, Reverend Sharpton, we have a toxic stew here. White supremacy ideology that's spreading. Easy access to guns. Permissive Internet culture that that almost uh, encourages uh, sharing of this uh, far right ideology. Where do we start? We start by changing the tone nationally. We cannot just keep going through, as you said to Mayor Brown, you've heard Mayor say this before in the government, federal government doesn't do anything. Last night, uh, when I started getting calls from our National Action Network chapter in Buffalo, what happened? And then uh, I started getting calls from government officials. First thing I said is President Biden needs to call a summit meeting of black, Jewish, Asian leaders oh. and sit down and talk about the growing problem of hate crimes and that this government will not stand by and allow this to happen. We need to have a tone where young guys like this understand the federal right there. No, 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 no. That's a con game. Family, when they do that, that is a con game. Sharpton, no, you got to be called out for that Sharpton. Sharpton, you're a liberal mascot. You know good and well, Sharpton, that that is designed to undermine us. When you want to have a summit with all of these other groups, that man didn't go in that supermarket and kill all these other groups. He didn't have racial epithets towards those other groups on his gun. That man went in there and started slaughtering black folks. That man sat up there, cased out a black neighborhood and specifically targeted a black neighborhood. And you're trying to all lives matter that when something happens to a synagogue or when something happens to the Asian community, they don't include us. They don't sit here and say, we need to get with some of the black leaders and talk about how to fix this. They don't ever do that. We we're not going to undermine our people, Sharpton. Shame on you, brother. Because people make it seem like we're unjustly beaten up on Sharpton. This type of stuff ain't going to fly. Sharpton is selling us out right in front of our eyes for his own personal gain. You're going to be called out if you do that. We are the ones who need a hate crime bill specifically for us. The Asians have one. In fact, you can't do anything to an Asian person now, especially if you're black. They got the Asian hate crime bill wrapped up in that COVID stuff, talking about the, the crimes against Asians have, has risen because of COVID. So now a, a, a black person, if you argue with somebody Asian, they're going to lock you up. Now, there's some white supremacists who will sit up and say, well, there's already hate crime bills and everybody is covered. No, they're not covered because the hate crime bills and the enforcement of it is racially enforced. They enforce it based on racial lines. You understand what I'm saying? Meaning, in order for them to enforce a hate crime to protect a black person, it has to be a mouth-frothing white supremacist neo-Nazi who's yelling the N-word while they're committing the crime. In order for these so-called hate crime laws to be applied to protect black people, they have to kill us. We have to wait until we get killed by these white supremacists, then maybe they'll enforce it. But only if they kill us while yelling the N-word. They literally have to be yelling the N-word with a, with a neo-Nazi sticker somewhere on their bodies. They have to be a mouth-frothing neo-Nazi Aryan Nation white supremacist. If they're not that, it's not going to be a hate crime. Black people are hit, are attacked by hate crimes all day. Every other day, there's some kind of Karen running up on a black person, aggrieving them, harassing them, profiling them almost every other day. These women don't even get arrested. There was a white boy down there in Florida. Somebody was talking about, well, there's this guy. He got hit with a hate crime charge because he tried to run over some black folks. Not only did he try to run them over, he was running around yelling racial epithets while he was doing it. He was a known white supremacist. And then he was talking about shooting up a whole bunch of black folks. So you have to be a um, damn near Adolf Hitler in order to get a hate crime put on you. If you aggrieve a black person, 
Asian person, all you have to do is argue with them. There's black people in New York who were getting arrested in perp walk for arguing with Asian people. They didn't hit them. They didn't fight them. They didn't curse them out. They just got into arguments with them and then got hit with Asian hate crime charges. You see? We don't want to wait until they have to kill us in order for them to maybe enforce the law. Because really up here in Buffalo, remember, when this man slaughtered all of these black people, the, the media and law enforcement, they were still talking about, well, we're going to investigate. We're, we're, we're investigating to see if it was possibly a hate crime. What? They were still not convinced. They were still playing dumb. Well, we're going to look into it. We're going to look in, and do some more investigation and some more research to see if this could possibly be labeled as a hate crime. What, his pre-confession, that wasn't enough? Him writing out a completed confession saying, hey, I'm about to go kill some niggas today and I hate niggas and they're the worst and we all should commit genocide against these folks. Yeah, he wrote that, but what, what what was his mindset when he wrote it? I mean, you know, he did have mental mental ill problem, mental illness problem. So, and just because he said that, there's no correlation between him actually doing it. You 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 understand me? That's what they said about Kyle Rittenhouse. Remember? That's what they said about Rittenhouse. Kyle Rittenhouse, the judge. Remember, Kyle Rittenhouse was on video driving by some protesters and on video he said man i wish i had my ar-15 boy i'd pick them off boy i really get them i take care of them he's on video saying this when the prosecution wanted to introduce that video into the the case where he actually went out and did what he said he was going to do kill people the judge was like well listen just because he said it that was weeks ago when he said it. Just because he said it on video, there's no correlation between him actually doing it. That judge actually said that. So we're not going to allow that in the courtroom. It's I'm white and I say so, family. So we have to be loud and proud about this. We need a specific anti-black hate crime bill that's going to protect us, ladies and gentlemen. We need something that's going to protect us. We need resources. We, we're going to have to stop being afraid to ask for that. And we got to stop all this forgiveness talk and all of this stuff. Because when, when these people aggrieve us, it become hugs and kisses time. Because remember, when, when Asians are aggrieved, boy, they, Biden and all those people, they immediately show up talking about, man, Hate crime laws, we're going to stiffen the hate crime laws. We're going to tighten these hate crime laws up. We're going to allocate a gazillion dollars to these Asian organizations. They start talking money and numbers the minute you agree one or two Asian people. But this is what we get, ladies and gentlemen, when our people get targeted by a genocidal white supremacists in large numbers. This is what we get right here. President Biden hugs a boy whose father was killed at the Topps Market mass shooting. So we get hugs. This was the headline. This is ABC News talking about Biden comes out and gives a little Negro child a hug whose father was killed. They come out giving us hugs. Damn a hug. We got to be on top of our game, family. They're going to come out here and try to hug us to damn death with all of this fake love. No, damn that. We got to stop going for these symbolic gestures, ladies and gentlemen. This is disrespectful. When we get shot up, all of a sudden it's hugs and singing. Remember, they sent Obama to that church up there in South Carolina. They sent him to that church in South Carolina to sing. No allocation of resources. No anti-hate crime bill that would protect us. You understand? These people are spitting in our faces and we have to stop it, ladies and gentlemen. So this is why we got to get our minds right. See, we got to get our self-esteem in order collectively. We got to get our minds and our esteem in order. This is why I want to talk about today. I want to talk about 10 strategies to success that we need to have. 10 
strategies that we need to keep in our minds and what we need to understand about being successful, black folks. I want y'all to listen to me. We let, let, Let's chop up some game like we used to chop it up on the Mac Lessons show. Because I used to do these on the Mac Lessons shows all the time. I haven't done it in a while. Just some principles and ideologies that we should have in our psychological back pockets or front pockets. We're going to drop some good game on today's broadcast, family. Let's talk about it. Let's get right into it. I'm gonna get, let's talk the 10 strategies to success because we got to start being empowered. And when we are empowered, people are not going to step to us with the, the nonsense. And all of us deserve success. We all deserve success, ladies and gentlemen. And we, as black folks, we got to start getting into the habit of being successful and doing things that's going to take us to levels of success that we need to be. Now, let's talk about the 10 strategies. Let's go number one, strategy one. The number one strategy to success, well, the first one, I won't say number one, but the first strategy is to listen to some game. Listen to game. Listen to somebody trying to game you up, giving you some good game. We in our society... We have this thing where everybody wants to talk and run their mouths and not really listen. That's why I don't like apps like Clubhouse. Clubhouse is good for that. If you go to Clubhouse, what do you have? A bunch of people on there just babbling. Not only are they babbling, everybody's babbling on top of each other. People just talking, 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 and babbling, and babbling, and babbling. And when everybody's talking and babbling, nobody's learning anything. See, this is why many people in the dominant society, they have think tanks. They understand we have to have um, some set aside minds who we've already curated and screened so they can get together without all the babbling people who don't know what they're talking about interfering with the discussion. So everybody who has knowledge can sit here and flesh out some ideas. You understand? That's why think tanks are very important. You get the good minds, put them all together, and let them flesh out ideas without having all of the, the damn babblers around wasting time. Because when it's time to chop up some good game, even in many of our spaces, what I like about um, Twitter space is that you can mute certain people and you can keep the discussion going and make it proactive. You understand you can mute certain people and get them out the paint real quickly and keep the conversation flowing without having a bunch of riffraffs coming in trying to sideline the conversation. You understand? That's what I like about Twitter space. And we use the Twitter spaces as think tanks to a certain degree. Yeah? But Clubhouse is horrible. It's, it's babble fest. It's completely horrible. But we have to learn how to listen to some game when somebody's trying to lace you with some good game and you see that they have some good game or they have certain levels of success. You need to sit down and listen to them, peep some game from them. Unfortunately, we are taught to hate on a person who has the ability to game you up. Hating don't get you get you nowhere. Hating is a useless phenomenon. Hating is some backwards as nothing. It's, it's nonsense. When you see somebody who's shining and you see somebody who's up and they got it the real way, you better sit down and see what that person did. Find out what kind of habits they were into in order to get to their position instead of projecting your own failures on that person. When you see somebody who's shining, a lot of us be like, well, damn, that nigga must have stole something. He must have been scamming, especially a lot of the tethers. That nigga must be doing a scam. That's you projecting your failure. Learn from somebody instead of projecting your own failure onto them. Learn some game from that person. Listen to them. Study them. Even if you don't like the person, listen. I study some of these white supremacists. Even though I don't like them, I listen to some of their ideologies. I study some of these white supremacists. I understand while I'm studying them, some things might be, I have to take them with a grain of salt because this is a white supremacist. But you have to study some of these folks. You have to watch them. If they got some good game, 
I'm going to take some of that good game they got. When they start leaning back into some of their white supremacist teachings, okay, then I'm going to back up off of them. I know where they're coming from, but you can study game from everybody. For most people, there are some people who's just, you can't get nothing from, but study game, man. Get some game from some people. Now, the second strategy, ladies and gentlemen, is to ask for yours. You know the old saying, closed mouths don't get fed. That's absolutely true. A lot of us don't get nothing because you don't ask for it. A lot of folks don't get what they need because they sit up here. Not only do they not ask for it, they got this sense of entitlement where the person or people should just give them stuff just because. That's It's not going to work like that. You got to go out here and let people know what you need. You got to let them know what you want. You got to let them know what you need. And you have to let them know what you can bring to the table in order for them to give it to you. But even if you don't have anything to bring to the table, you never know what position a person is in on that particular day. That's why it never hurts to put your bid in. It never hurts to put your bid in, ladies and gentlemen. I remember one time... And I think I told this story before. I was down in Alabama. Uh, we were on our way to Atlanta. I was young. We were teens at the time. A friend of mine, we were on our way to Atlanta. Then our car broke down over in Anniston, Alabama. Anniston, Alabama is at the halfway mark from Birmingham to, to Atlanta. Our car broke down. So we on the freeway, we walked to a little Hick gas station because over there in Alabama, it's, you're in the sticks when you get out of Birmingham. You were in the sticks. So we went, walked off the freeway, got off the ramp and went to this old hills have eyes type of gas station. All right. And we told the gas station, I, I don't know if he was the owner or the uh, employee. He was an old hillbilly, old hillbilly white man with Confederate flags all over the place. And even though we were stuck, we were up here in, in the middle of nowhere. And this dude had Confederate flags all over the place. I'm like, well, damn, we, there's no way other place to walk. I can't walk no other place. So I, I, I said, let me humble myself, even though this guy has all types of racist flags up here and he looks like the grand dragon of the clan i said hey let me let me just ask him hey brother um our car broke down we're gonna pay for gas here but can we pay you give you a couple of dollars to give us a ride on the back of your truck to our car sir had to humble myself i had to ask the guy because I, I didn't want to walk back because it was dark at this point now it's dark it's pitch black. This is in the woods of Alabama. It's pitch black. And this man who could have been a suspected white supremacist, he was like, just take my keys and go. That white man gave us the car. He gave us the truck, gave us the keys and said, hey, just go ahead and just bring the car back. For a minute, I thought it was a trick. I'm like, oh, is he going to let us take the car and say that we stole it? You know? But he gave us the keys to his little rickety truck. We took the truck down there, filled my car up, put the gas in, brought his truck back. He's like, all right, man, you guys have a good day. So we were okay. So now the fact that we had to, I had to ask. Yeah, somebody said we was about to get lynched. I was thinking that. I'm like, hell. It wasn't a setup. He was actually cool. He was actually cool. Hillbilly like a mug. Gave us the keys to the truck. Actually, absolutely cool. And I wouldn't have got that if I didn't ask. You got to ask, ladies and gentlemen, even if it's uh, somebody who you think you might be in danger. Now, don't, you know, don't let your guard down. Because, again, even though this guy let us have his truck, I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm trying to hurry up and put the gas in and get back as quickly as possible so this guy don't say that hey, we tried to steal the truck because it could have been a setup or whatever. But. Again, we got what needed to be done. We got what needed to be done. We got it done. You got to ask sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, now I'm not going to buck the eyes. And, oh, white people ain't bad. Oh, these are some good white people. Oh, thank you so much. No, I'm not, I'm not that now. I'm thinking, now this guy could still be, he could have some dead bodies in the basement somewhere. All right. Who knows? But that day. I guess he was in a good mood that day and let us use his truck. 
Yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm not gonna go to the to the the cookout at his house now. I'm not that grateful. Thank you, sir. I'm gonna keep it pushing. Yeah. And and truth be told. Truth be told, those white people down in the South with them Confederate flags, those Republicans, those right wingers, uh, let me tell you something. Truth be told, they're actually cooler than a lot of these so-called white liberals in the North and in the West. The white people down South who are Republicans and they got Confederate flags, they're some of the most hospitable people you want to meet. I'm going to tell you real talk, and I'm not on some, oh, all white people ain't bad. No, some of those people are some of the most hospitable people you will want to meet. They're extremely polite. They'll hold the door open for you. Some of those rednecks down there are very hospitable. They're very polite down there. They'll actually help you out. Down in Alabama. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They are. They're more hospitable than some of them so-called white liberals. They really are. When you look at these Karen videos that you see online all the time, it's always some liberals. These Karen videos where black folks are getting run up on by these white Karens, it's always in a liberal city. It's always in a, a liberal neighborhood. Up there in the Bay, all those Karen videos up there in San Francisco and Oakland, San Francisco, they pride themselves on being liberal. You walk off in some of those liberal areas, them Karens run up on you so fast. You dig? Let's be, let's keep it a buck. I don't get too comfortable around them, no, but let's be clear. As far as just hosp hospitality, yeah, they're very hospitable. But you got to ask for yours. You see, and that's what we're doing now in the political realm when we're trying to get our reparations. See, we have now just started collectively saying, hey, what about us as black people? What about us as foundational black Americans? Can you do something for us? And they're, they've been so used to not doing stuff for us. They're tripping right now. They've been so used to not doing stuff for us. They're going crazy because we're demanding something now. But we have to understand this. We're not going to get anything done unless we ask for it. You got to ask for yours. How's my audio? Somebody said, the, how's the audio, guys? If the audio is good, give me a thumbs up. Hold on one second. How's the audio? Hold on. They're going crazy. Okay, my audio sounds good. Is my audio good? Because some people are saying the audio. I think the audio is good. Somebody might just be trolling. Okay, is my audio good, ladies and gentlemen? Shout out to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Is my audio good, ladies and gentlemen? All right, the audio is good. Audio is fine. Okay. It was somebody's listening with a janky computer. I right, hit that thumbs up button. Hit that like button. The audio is fine. Okay. Got it. I don't want to be talking and the audio is jack jacked up. Okay, let, let, let's get to the third thing, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get to the third thing. The, the, the third strategy to success family is that you have to learn how to sacrifice you have to sacrifice certain levels of your time now to benefit and reap the benefits of the sacrifice later that's very important we have this thing now in our culture where we got to get instant gratification right now Everything has to be about gratification right this very minute. We got to feel good. Everything has to be good, 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 good. Right here, right here, right here. Life doesn't work like that. Family, you have to put some things aside and you have to sacrifice some time so that you can reap those benefits later. It's that ass, uh, what was it? grasshopper and the ant. It's that whole story of the grasshopper and the ant. And the story is the grasshopper was lollygagging and BSing around during the summer. And the ant was storing food. The ant was getting his, his food together, getting his shelter together. All summer, the ant was getting it together. The grasshopper was like, hey, man, what you doing, man? It's nice out here. We turning up. I'm about to go swimming. 
the grasshopper's lollygagging around the ant like man i'm working man i'm stacking stacking this food up stacking up this bread stacking up my food i'm, I'm getting my crib together i'm working hard this summer and then when winter came the ant was chilling up in the crib eating good popping bottles chopping it up the the ant was balling out in the winter time and the grasshopper out here in the cold starving bucking his eyes that's a great parable that's been around for a long time and we have to understand the importance of that that narrative we have to stop trying to turn up all the time part of our culture is all about turning up 24 hours a damn day and not getting anything done that we need to get done. We have to sacrifice the turn up in order to work and stack up what we need to stack up for later so that we're good. And that shows discipline when you're able to discipline yourself and sacrifice just some of your time. For future gains, you're going to be good. Look, when I was in my mid-20s, I wrote my, my first bestseller in my mid-20s. I wrote the book, The Art of Mackin. Now, at that time, 20 dudes in their 20s, we're trying to go out. We're trying to club. All these fine ladies at the club cooperating. You want to do that every other night out here. You know, this was in the late 90s, man, when the, the clubs out here were popping beautiful women at the club you can pull a dime every other night out here but i had a great idea for a book i had a great idea for a book and i knew that the book if i just sat down and wrote the book because i had some great ideas and some great strategies that i wanted to jot down and share with people i said if i write this book this book would be a bestseller i just have to discipline myself enough to sit down and write this book and I'm used to going to the clubs, the ladies calling, hey, what you doing? I want to come through and whoop de whoop And I had to say, hey, let me sacrifice my time. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to be going on dates. I'm going to lock myself in the crib for a few months, missing out on all the partying. And I got to discipline myself and I got to make myself write this book. I got to make myself write it every single day. Because if I miss a day, I'm going to slack off. If I miss a day, I'm going to slack off and I'm going to keep slacking off. So I got to do it every day. I got to be dedicated to this. So let me not go out to the clubs. I ain't going out partying. I ain't going out kicking it. My friends hit me up, man. Man, we at the club. It's a gang of bitches at this club, man. It's a, man, one of them asking about you, man. You going to come through? I'm like, ah, oh, man. Oh, I was so tempted. All the girls hopping on the phone. Hey, Tyreek, where you at? <laughs> you coming through? Oh, God. I got some fire. Oh, I bet you do, ma'am. But I rebuke you. I'm, in a, I'm on a spiritual journey, ma'am. I have to rebuke that. I had to stay in the crib and discipline myself. I couldn't be out there in them streets. And they were throwing the sweets in the streets for me. I had to say no to the sweets in the streets. I can't do it. I got to do this. This is something very important. This was 20 something years ago, ladies and gentlemen. I said, no, I got to be in the house. I got to write this book. I'm in my, my crib by myself writing every day, writing my ass off. Finally put that book out. It was a huge bestseller. I make money off that book to this day. I still make a lot of money off that book. 20 something years later. That was a lifetime investment. I'm going to get paid from that book for the rest of my life and my children's lives. You understand? Making a few sacrifices. I made sacrifices to stay in the crib just for a few months, and that has paid off for all of my life. We got to have that kind of discipline. Yeah, I turned into Umar. It's business over booty. <laughs> It's politics over Punani. It's business over back shots. I turned into Umar for a minute. I was bucking my eyes and sniffing. <laughs> but you got to have that discipline. You got to have it. And you got to be willing to sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Now that brings us to the next one, ladies and gentlemen. What number is this? This three or four. 
I'm all over the place. All right, what what number am I on, ladies and gentlemen? All right, what number is this? I'm just going on a rant here. Help me out with the numbers. Let me make sure I'm, that I'm in the right order here. What number am I on? All right, y'all help me out, family. Because I want to get this thing right. We're, we're talking up some good game for the family. Like we're talking up good game. Uh, this is I'm on number four. All right, all right, number four. There we go. Thank you, family. All right, number four, and this is very important, family. This is very, very, very important. Number four, black folks in particular, stop prioritizing getting high. If you want a strategy to success, stop prioritizing getting high. I, look, I'm not in your house. I'm not trying to be the moral police. I'm not trying to tell y'all what to do. I know a lot of y'all like to smoke the tweeds and the marijuanas, pop the mollies or whatever. I'm telling you that is not a strategy to success. You will be more successful if you did not do that. You do not have to alter your mind state in order to get stuff done. That's a con game that we've been taught to run on each other. I really want us to get off this get high all the time nonsense. Look, sometimes people might want to drink a little something, smoke a little something to get the edge off, whatever. Me, I, I don't drink, nor do I smoke. I've never been drunk, never been high. Because I understand my, my brain and my mind, that is my greatest asset. And I need to keep that clear. I got to keep this mind very clear, ladies and gentlemen. So I didn't want to play those games. I had to keep my mind clear. And understand, getting high, that's ultimately about masking some type of trauma. There's always some kind of subliminal trauma there. Either some type of personalized trauma that happened directly to you in your life or just the trauma of being under a system of white supremacy where you have to kind of sedate yourself in order to deal with the stress of it. See, this is why I always choose to go after white supremacy directly every day. I ain't about to get high. I want to keep focused on this big ass problem called systematic white supremacy. I need to keep my mind real clear to deal with that. Because remember, it's the white supremacists who are the ones coming down to you, introducing all the damn narcotics to you, especially the white women. The white women are good for that. They love coming around niggas bringing cocaine and all the mollies and the ecstasy. They're the ones who bring that around you. For the most part, white women love doing that. But see, they know how to do just enough so they're not off their game. They'll do a little of it with you, but understand that they're white. So them messing with drugs here or there there's a glass bottom that they can reach that's that's not going to take them too low. So they can just dust themselves off. Even if they're cracked out or whacked out or meffed out of their mind, at one point they can just get up and dust themselves off and they can get elevated back into the throngs of white supremacy and they'll be taken care of. See, we don't have that luxury. We don't have that luxury of being strung out. You see, I always use the, the example of Robert Downey Jr., the actor. He's an A-list actor right now. But at one point, Robert Downey Jr. was running around L.A., cracked out of his mind. During the 90s, Robert Downey Jr. was getting caught in a crack house every other week out here in L.A. That man was a full-blown crackhead. Not saying that to disparage him, but that's what it was. He was getting arrested every other day. And Todd Bridges, too. Todd Bridges was on that narcotic. Now, look at Todd Bridges' career. Look at Robert Downey's career. Todd Bridges, we don't know what he's doing, and no disrespect to him. That's all we know Todd Bridges for is being a drug addict. And again, no disrespect to that brother. But now, Robert Downey Jr., they dusted him off and made him an A-list actor again. Like, And they, they never even talk about the crack. They act like that whole crack run he did didn't even happen, do they? When the last time you heard them even mention that that man was on the narcotic? They don't ever do that. Now, somebody said Samuel Jackson. Now, Sam, and I give him credit, he, he was on the narcotic before he got famous. So, Sam, he dusted himself off and then became famous. See, you don't have a lot of black people who got famous, got on the pipe, and was able to get back on 
like that. You really don't have it like that. Yeah, somebody said, yeah, they they fail upward. You know, in white society, you can fail up. You think? But yeah, we got to stop prioritizing getting high. You got to keep your mind crisp. You get more done being on top of your mental game. You don't need to get high to be creative. See, that's a con game. They know that us altering our mind, that's going to stifle our physical and mental growth, ultimately. So don't let them run that con game on you that we got to be getting high and turning up. That's why they promote that in the music so much. Every other rap song is about getting high, smoke fest, you know? Popping this pill, popping that pill. And we got to stop falling for that con game, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's get to the next thing. Number five, right? We're at number five. Number five, family, we have to start prioritizing truth. Let's not be afraid of the truth. Not, let's not be afraid of seeking the truth. We're so used to people lying to us. We get used to the lies and we get comfortable with people lying to us. We have to prioritize seeking out truth. We have to make finding the truth habit forming. When you seek the truth and become a habitual truth seeker, that becomes intoxicating to a certain degree. That becomes habit forming because that takes you down other rabbit holes of truth. Truth is power. You understand? Truth, and Dr. Welsing talked about this, truth is a power force. The truth will always make itself known, by the way, even though when there's people lying, when there's people scamming, the truth will make itself known. Truth is an energy. It's a power force. You understand? I give you an example for out here in L.A. For a long time, we were and this is in the 80s. We were complaining about the police brutality out here in Los Angeles. And we were told by the authorities, what police brutality? Ain't no police brutality. We don't see it. And we kept telling, hey, man, we're getting brutalized out here on the low. These cops, boy, they'll take us behind a building somewhere and rough us up and they do all types of real disgusting stuff to us behind the scenes, especially in the jails. Down there in L.A. County, they had these little secret rooms they would take brothers in and rough them up and do all types of stuff to them. And they kept playing the denial game. Oh, no, we're not. You niggas are just making it up. And we kept saying, hey, man, y'all better do something. We keep telling people, Hey, man, these folks are abusing us behind the scenes. Y'all need to do something. Oh, you niggas, y'all you fables. You Negroes love just lying. You lying Negroes. Nobody's doing anything to you. You're your own worst enemy. What about black on black crime? And then one day they were doing one of their abuses over there in Lakeview Terrace. There's a place called Lakeview Terrace up here in the, the San Fernando Valley area. They pulled over Rodney King on a dark road. They saw that there was no lighting out there. No cars around. It was very quiet over there. And they said, oh, good. Nobody's watching. Let's light into his ass. And they started beating Rodney King. Now, little did they know there was a white man who just happened to have a video camera who was secretly recording them. They didn't know that they were being secretly recorded. And at that time, a lot of people didn't have video cameras at this time. See, everybody has a camera now on their phone. But at this time, this was very unique because a lot of people just weren't carrying around portable video cameras all over the place. But that was the truth energy being at the right place at the right time. Capturing that. Capturing that brutal beatdown. And then when it went to trial, the video went all over the place and we were like, see, this is what we've been telling you. We've been telling you this is what they've been doing. We've been telling you this. And the white supremacist said, yeah, I know it's on video and I know y'all been telling us this, but yeah, no crime was committed here. Not guilty. And the street said, OK, well, let's take this thing into our hands now. And 
The rest is history. You understand? And the city ended up getting a billion dollar bill. That was the truth making itself known. Truth is a power force that's always going to make itself known. So we should always look for that truth power. We should make it our priority to always seek the truth. We don't need the truth to seek us. We need to seek it. We need to uncover the truth. We need to be looking out for the truth. The truth is there. The truth wants it, wants to be known. When I was doing the, the films that I do, I would stumble upon a lot of information. The truth, I'm looking for the truth and the truth is looking for me. I'm doing research about certain things and I would just stumble upon just hidden forms of history and more truth. And that's what I put in the films. You can't run from the truth. The truth is always going to look for you. That's why you look for it. So you prioritize looking for truth. Now let's get to the, the next strategy, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is six. Strategy number six. This is a powerful strategy. Write down your plan. Family, when you write down your plans, that's very powerful because you're writing down something physical. You've taken something out of your mind. You've put it in the physical world. And then it will further physically manifest itself. Because when you start writing stuff down, you're creating a map. And you're creating a physical map. And all you have to do in order to reach success is write down that physical map to success and you will get to the end goal. See, we think success is all about luck and chance. This is what we're taught by the white supremacists. We're taught that someday the Lord is going to shine some good graces on you. No, you have to go out here and map out your success. Family, if you start writing stuff down, and planning it out, you are going to be successful and follow the map. Because we all have skills and talents that we could utilize. We just have to cultivate those skills and talents, find out how to gain an audience for those skills and talents, find out how to charge for those skills and talents, and find out how to aggregate the money and stack the money up to the goals we need so we can acquire the things we need. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say you're just a person starting off from scratch. I'm gonna tell you how to step-by-step step do something successful. Let's say, hey, I don't have money. I'm 19 years old. I don't have money. I need some money. Let's say I want money for a car. I want a $70,000 car. Right now, I have no money, have no job. Now, what do I do? For example, what I can do, what do people need? Let me write this down. Okay, what I can do is, I kind of like cutting hair. I cut my own hair. Let me master the art of cutting hair so that I can be very good. Let me write that down. So let me go to a barber school. All right, let me... Let me go work a little fast food BS job real quick to get enough money for barber school. Let me write that down. So I will go to barber school three months, four months or whatever, learn how to cut hair. Or I can go to some of these barber shops, chop up game with one of the brothers who work there and kind of ask them to show me. Let me write that down. So now you've gone to barber school you planned it out. I'll be in barber school for three or four months. Let me get my barber's license. I have how long it takes. Okay, now that I got my barber's license, let me go write down all the names of the barber shops around town and see if I can go in here and get some booth space. All right. When people come in, let me get my clientele up. Let me write this down. My goal is to get 20 regular customers a week. 
That is my goal. Let me write that down. If I get 20 regular customers a week, so you got to start planning it out like that. If I get 20 regular customers a week, let me write it down and then charge them $20 a cut, get 400 a week. All right. When I get that 400 a week, I eat off that, stack it up. I get that $400 a week. I'm still staying with mom, so that's good. So that's $1,600 a month. I ain't really got to pay rent. So I keep stacking up this $400 a week, eat off of it, buy a couple of little shoes here and there, but I really save my money. In the next 12 months or however many months, I can get that car I wanted. Let me write all this stuff down and let me follow this blueprint that I just wrote down. You will get that damn car if you did just what I said. And that's not hard to do at all. All you have to do is plot it out and plan it out. It's that simple, family. It is that simple. And I'm just using barbering as an example. You can say, hey, man, I like doing tattoos. I can draw real good. Let me learn how to do tattoos. Let me learn how to do the get the tattoo brushes and learn how to do tattoos. There's always people who want tattoos. Let me go to a tattooing school and let me get cool with some of these people at the tattoo shop up here. Let me get a certain level of clients every week. Let me go out here and advertise. Let me get on Instagram. Let me put a hashtag tattoo in Memphis. Let me put a hashtag up here so that people in Memphis can know that I do tattoos. Let me write that down. Let me get, if I get 20, 30 people a month, I'm good to go. I'm telling y'all how to write and plot this stuff out. You will get whatever goal you need to reach. You just got to write that stuff down and just follow the map. When I do my movies and I've shown y'all my notebooks, my notebooks are full of just pages upon pages upon pages upon, upon pages of notes, 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 notes. I'm writing notes nonstop because I plan and I plot all of this stuff out. When I do this movie, I got to do this, this, this in the movie. I got to do this, this, that in the movie. Then when I do it, which platform am I going to use? I'm going to write down all the movie theaters that I got to contact. I'm going to write down all of the distributors that I got to contact. Now that I got a good deal, like some of the movie theaters, they let me get the screens for free and they'll take the money off the back end because I've done so much good business with them. They're like, oh shit, you got the theaters, you good to go. You don't even have to put no money up front. So bam, I just got to put the movies in there and I get my money off the back end. They get their money off the back end and we're good to go. And then I figure out what other platform I'm going to put the films on. I write all of that out and I know how much money we're going to make. I plan it all out. I know how much money I'm going to get. And I go for that goal. I don't leave it up to chance. I say, if I'm going to put the movie in these many theaters, I'm going to make sure I'm going to write down how I'm going to promote it in each city to make sure every seat is filled, which is what we do. Then I'm going to make this amount of money. I already know how much money I'm going to make when I do these movies. I already know. Because I plan it out. I, I look at the dollar sign. And then I take the steps needed and write it out and map it out to get to that dollar sign. Write your stuff down. It's very powerful writing your stuff down. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I'm at home with a bunch of kids doing all this stuff. I don't want to hear no excuses. I got a house full of kids. I got a house full of kids, and I'm still doing all of this stuff with all the kids running around with kids and dogs jumping all over the place. You write that stuff down, and the stuff you write down is your map, ladies and gentlemen. All right? Let's get to the next strategy. What number are we on, family? What number are we on? Help me out, family. Let me make sure I'm on the right number. I think I'm on number seven. Am I on number seven? Number seven, ladies and gentlemen, you have to feed your mind. You have to feed your mind with constructive information all the time. 
Number seven is very important. Feed your mind. Because whatever you put in your mind is going to either feed it or it's going to poison it. What's the first thing you put in your mind? What's the first thing you look at when you get up in the morning? You know what people do? A lot of times when we wake up, the first thing a lot of us do in our culture, a lot of folks start going to these goofy gossip sites. A lot of folks start looking at world star. I used to get people sending me world star links in the morning. I don't even watch that stuff. The last thing I want to do is watch your world star link early in the morning. I don't even watch that stuff at night. I don't really watch world star like that. But if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you look at is some damn world star video of niggatry and ratchetness, you're poisoning your mind for the day. You're not going to be too much of a constructive person if you're putting poison in your mind at the beginning of the day. You have to feed your mind with some constructive information. These gossip sites, they're just as bad. Watching rappers and celebrities and their dating habits or whatever they're doing, that's not really that constructive, to be honest. That's poisoning your mind to a certain degree, too, because it's not constructive. You know what I like? I like for what my brother... Professor Black Truth is doing. He has something called the Moment of Truth where he does a broadcast every single morning, Monday through Friday, and he gives constructive information first thing in the morning. That's the type of stuff that we have to seek out. People who are giving constructive information first thing in the morning. Things that we could utilize that can empower us for the rest of our day and for the rest of our lives. We have to look out for powerful empowering information that feeds our minds your mind is like a plant what you put on that plant will either make it grow or kill it and you'll kill your brain cells with non-constructive ratchet nothing ass information feed your mind constructively family let's get to number eight Number eight is very important. Family, you got to learn how to, people say you got to learn how to handle your success, but number eight, you got to learn how to handle failures. Family, listen to me. You better be prepared to fail in life. Whatever you try to do, sometimes you're going to fail in life. That's almost inevitable. Sometimes you're going to try some stuff and it ain't going to work out. Sometimes you're going to write some stuff down and you're going to try it out and it ain't going to work like you wanted it to work. Sometimes you are going to fail. That's almost inevitable. Especially if you're going into a new venture. A lot of times, most likely you're going to fail. The thing is handling that failure because that failure is supposed to be a lesson for you. You better handle your failure so that you can learn from them. Now listen, my, my first big successful film was Hidden Colors 1. My first big, majorly successful worldwide film was Hidden Colors 1. We did Hidden Colors 1, hugely successful. And my most unsuccessful film was the film I did right after that. To this day, it's been my most unsuccessful film. The one right after Hidden Colors, not Hidden, not Hidden Colors 2. I did another film right after Hidden Colors 1 called The Eugenist. That was a horror film, and it was horrible with all the stuff that went on. It was a fiasco shooting that film. Everything that could have went wrong went wrong with it. It was a disaster behind the scenes. My least successful film right after Hidden Colors. Now, the fact that it was not a success was a good thing because that helped me learn how to make the other films successful. I needed that failure. Somebody said they were an extra in it. Shout out to you. I needed that because I needed to know what not to do. Oh, it was all over the place. We were trying to get different schools and we had to, we shot some down in Atlanta. We shot it for like a week down there. Then we shot it at another school out here and my camera guy, this white boy, he was real funny style. He was a suspected white supremacist, so I didn't screen him good enough. And 
the crew. It was it was a fiasco behind the scenes. My editors, it was a mess with them. It was a mess behind the scenes. A lot of stuff that went on, but I learned from it. I learned from it. It's not a bad movie because it, it does good around Halloween. It wasn't a it wasn't the best movie. It was, it was a cool for what it was, but it wasn't as successful as my other films. But I learned from it. We learned how to screen for the right camera crews. We learned how to screen for the right actors. We learned how to get the right permits. So we learned a lot from that. I got a lot of game from all of the missteps of that film. That film was a learning experience. And all of us, we have films that was a fiasco behind the scenes. Sometimes those fiascos could be redeemed. Like when they were shooting the movie Jaws, it was a fiasco shooting that movie, even though it was a commercial success. Steven Spielberg and those guys, they would always complain about that damn shark. The shark wouldn't work. The shark was janky. They were going through so much trying to get that film going, but they ultimately got it together and it became a huge blockbuster. You dig? So you have to learn from your failures. You have to manage your failures and use your failures as a learning experience. A lot of times when people fail, they just throw in the damn towel and give up. You fail at something and be like, oh, damn, man, I, I ain't going to do this no more. This ain't for me. Now, sometimes certain things ain't for you, but certain sometimes when you fail at something, that means you just have to come at it a different way. You have to learn from it if you're passionate about it. Just come at it a different way and step it up and learn how to not do what you did that failed the first time. Yeah. Let's get to the next one. What number we have? We had number nine. I think we're at number nine. All right, we're at number nine. Now, number nine is transform your knowledge into wisdom. Now, earlier I talked about the importance of getting to the truth, which is knowledge, but also when you get knowledge, that has to be transferred into wisdom and it can only be transferred into wisdom if you have learned how to use your knowledge to gain certain levels of success and to make good judgment. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom because you could be somebody who knows things, but you haven't applied it. You know things, but you haven't applied it to make yourself successful. You can be just one of these like prison lawyers. You know every law, but nigga, you in prison. You haven't gotten out of prison. You just, you in prison knowing all the laws. You understand? You haven't applied it or you weren't in a position to apply it before you got in jail, but you got to apply your knowledge in a constructive manner. That gives you wisdom. You see, this is why there's a difference between somebody being old and wise who's an elder or you just being an old nigga and unfortunately in the hood we got a bunch of old niggas running around here who have no wisdom see an elder is somebody who's older who can tell you from experience what to do and what not to do so that you can navigate through life better that's an a, an elder with wisdom an elder will sit you down and say hey man i've been there i've done that you don't need to go that route because this 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 will happen so I'm telling you from experience, let me have you go another way based on my experience. That's wisdom. You have old niggas in the hood still doing the same dumbass nonsense they were doing 40 and 50 years ago. You have old niggas running around here with no wisdom whatsoever. Out there in Buffalo, let's go back to Buffalo. Remember, there was a, a, a middle-aged Sambo out there. When that white supremacist went out there, to get our brothers and sisters and ambush them. He went to that store a day before to case out the place and the white supremacist was up here talking to this old Negro, this old middle-aged Negro who was sitting here cock-con and kiki with this white supremacist, not understanding the threat that this man posed. Now, if this was a man, the, the, the black dude who was talking to this white supremacist, if this was somebody who had wisdom they would have said, hey, white supremacists, you need to get up off this block. And they would have warned all the other young people, hey, man, there's a threat going on here. We need to keep our eyes open. But this fool was sitting up here having a conversation with this white supremacist, 
talking about he had the word genius on his shirt and I talked to him and I was like, oh, he is a genius. That fool actually said that. That's not a person with wisdom. That's just an old nigga in the hood. We don't need just old niggas in the hood running around no more. We need people who are going to acquire wisdom so that they can help the young folks navigate better. This is why a lot of the OGs, if you talk to a real OG, somebody who's been through the trenches, what they'll do, they'll try to deter people from getting into any kind of street business. That's wisdom. You have old dudes now who's still out here trying to gangbang. That's dumb nigga nonsense. You old as hell, you still out here trying to gangbang and you're trying to encourage others to gangbang with you. That That's corny. When you get to a certain age, you're supposed to have enough wisdom to say, hey, man, we don't need to go that route. Man, I done been locked up for 15, 20 years because of that. We got to take this to another level and grow and be more constructive because I wasted my life for that. I don't want you to waste your life for that. Because I have kids that I weren't I wasn't able to raise. So I don't want y'all to be in that position where y'all not able to raise your kids. So let's go another direction. That's OG wisdom. We need to be on that time. All right. You gotta you gotta successfully apply your knowledge. And when you apply that knowledge and get wisdom, you know how to not be manipulated by the white supremacists. That's another thing, too. Wisdom helps you understand that. I was debating this white supremacist yesterday. You can listen to it on my my Tariq channel here. I was debating him yesterday. And if I want y'all to listen to it because it's a master class of studying how these people operate. Now, he called up. He was extremely friendly when he called up. When he called up, he was extremely friendly. All right. He was hella friendly when he called up. He called up. Hey, Tariq, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to get some information here. I'm really trying to learn from you, buddy. He was doing that game which is a con game. And I, I peeped it for what it was. I wasn't, I wasn't going to go for that. I wasn't going to go for that at all. He was trying to be friendly and trying to play the nice role. You know, I'm just trying to learn. I'm trying to learn about racism and everything, buddy. I'm just trying to get some information here. And, you know, I, you know, if you say racism exists, I'm going to look out for it. And I'm going to, you know, I'll help you. I'll join. I'll be arm in arm with you against white supremacy. If there's any white supremacy out there, he was trying to run that con game and I kept pointing out white supremacy and he started getting hostile. You're a race baiter because I kept debunking all of his talking points. The more I debunked his talking points and I didn't fall for the whole nice white supremacy routine and we're all buddies and we're all brothers in the same struggle. I said, no, sir, we had we got systematic white supremacy out here. And he kept denying it. Then you're not trying to be my buddy. You're practicing white supremacy like everybody else. See, wisdom helps you understand not to fall for those trick bags. You're being a coward, Tariq, because you're muting me because I kept muting him because he tried to babble. He tried to do what a lot of white supremacists do. They sit here throwing out all of these jive talking points. They come out here lying left and right. And then when we call them out, they try to babble their way through it and talk over you and then low-key troll their way out of it, and I wouldn't let them do that. See, the white supremacists, when they get on your platforms, you got them. Because, see, they like having you on their platform so that they can control the, the platform. So when you start debunking them, they can start muting you, they can start cutting your mic off, and they can start talking over you. They like to control the, the, the forum in which they're discussing racism so they, they can sabotage the discussion for their own benefit. That's like when I'm when I'm on Fox News, they're always cutting my mic off. Every time I start getting at them, they just cut your mic off. So they're used to doing that. They're used to trolling and all of that stuff. But when they get on our platforms and I let them talk, I mute them when they start babbling and trying to talk over me. I'm not going to let you talk over me and deflect. I'm going to bring you back to where you need to be to answer the question I ask. 
or they get all ruffled because then you put them on the hot seat. It takes wisdom to get to that point, to not let these people manipulate you, ladies and gentlemen. That's why wisdom is important. You understand how to apply your knowledge. All right, now let's get to the last one. Number 10, ladies and gentlemen. And number 10 is very important. The 10th the strategy to success. You have to demand equal compensation. You have to demand equal compensation and offer equal compensation. When you demand equal compensation, that will take you to a level of success. And when you offer equal compensation, that will get you to a level of success that you need to be. Now, what does that mean? That means you pay for what you need to pay for and you have others pay for what you have to offer. If you have something of value, don't be afraid to have people pay the correct value for what you have to offer. And you don't be afraid to pay for something that is of value to you. That's going to be of constructive value. Do you know what I'm talking about? For example, we, a lot of times in black society, we always want the hookup when it comes to other black folks, but we need to learn from black folks who can give us some game. Let's learn from them. Because we try to project our own devalued mindset onto another black person. There's a lot of black people out of here who do good business. We should pay them for doing good business. Unfortunately, we have other black folks who come around them and be like, hey, man, I know you got the shop going on and I know you got everything popping. But come on, nigga, let me get that hook up off you. Man, let me. How much is it? Dang, man. Is that much? Man, come on, brother. Asalaamu Alaikum, my brother. Come on, man. We brothers, man. Oh, you ain't keeping it real no more. Oh, you didn't change. You done forgot where you done come from. Is that what it is, my brother? You know, we get on that goofy nonsense. Pay that black person what they are owed. And when you get it popping, demand that you get equal compensation for what's owed to you. We can do good business with each other. You don't play that when white folks selling you stuff and Asian people are selling you janky ass products. They make you pay top dollar for that janky stuff. Pay for what you owe, because here's the thing. When you pay for what's owed, you value what you pay for. You want to go around people and be around things that you have to pay for because that puts value on it. Everything ain't about a hookup. Because when you start giving folks the hookup, they're not going to value it. See, that's why I don't let people bootleg my movies. No, you're not going to bootleg one. You're going to value my joint. Now, if you bootleg it, you got to steal it and all that stuff, which you still put value. When you start stealing stuff, understand you put more value on it. When you have to steal and bootleg stuff, you're putting value on it. See, that's how valuable my stuff is. I put a lot of money and a lot of time and effort on my stuff. So you're going to either pay for it or steal it. Either way, you're putting value on it. You see? Because I know it's that good. And you know it's that good. That's why you're stealing it. I'm talking to the Sambos out here who like stealing stuff. But you value what you pay for. And we collectively, let's let's put this in the, the political realm here. Let's put it in, in the political realm. We are devalued by the politicians because we let them galvanize us without paying us. That's why we're in the dilemma now with these folks giving us our damn money because we sat up here and we supported them year after year after year and they didn't have to pay nothing. That's why they are devaluing us now. We are now saying we are of value. We're not going to let you devalue us anymore. This is why it is imperative for us to get our reparations, to get our tangible bills from these people. 
we have to make them cough up the dough and specifically allocate resources and certain protections for us. It is imperative because we cannot let them devalue us anymore. We cannot let them no longer devalue us. You understand? We have to pay for what's owed and charge for what's provided. If you do good business, charge people correctly for it. You don't have to give hookups all the time. If you have a valuable service, there's so many talented black people out here, you make sure you give them what's needed. See, we value certain things. We value nigger trinkets in our society. A lot of times, what do we value? We value what you pay top dollar for. Normally, that's shoes and cars and cars accessories, rims, candy paint, and all of that stuff. And those are the main things goofy niggas in the hood will kill you for. They'll kill you over some shoes or in a car. People in the hood value that stuff with their lives because you spend a lot of money on that. Whatever you spend a lot of money on, you're going to put a lot of value on. See, we have to prioritize what we value. We have to value knowledge. We have to value good service. That's like when I do my films, I make sure that it's going to be on the level of Hollywood films that's done by the major studios so that you can value it because I value the audience. I have value for the audience. My thing, when I do my films, I make sure I'm going to do a big budget type of film for a black audience. See, when, when it comes to a black audience, people got this thing, well, we'll just throw something together. It's gonna be black folks, so they'll like it anyway. That's the BET strategy, which I don't like. That's kinda, and I hate to say it, the Tyler Perry strategy. No, no shade at Tyler. No shade at my brother Tyler Perry. I love that brother, much respect to what he's doing. But a lot of times, the quality of the films, I saw one Tyler Perry movie where they had a boom mic in the shot. I'm like, brother, y'all could have got somebody. Y'all didn't see the boom mic in the shot, brother. Some of those wigs, brother, y'all, you got enough money to get a better a wig budget, brother. And that's still my brother, love him. But you can at least step the wig budget up. It gets to the point, well, my audience, I got a black audience, they gonna watch anyway, so I don't need a wig budget. No. No, 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 no. We can't think like that. And again, that's no shade to my brother. I'm, I'm a stickler for that type of stuff. In, my, in the film we're doing now, man, every little detail, I'm a stickler. I look at every shot of the screen, if there's a wire, there was a couple of scenes in my new movie we're doing now. That's why it's taking so long where there were wires in the back. I had to go um, to, to affect artists to get that taken out. There was a scene where we were on the plantation. It was a, a damn um, a Dodge Durango in the back. Somebody car was in the back. I'm like, How the hell did y'all shoot that? I didn't even see that. So we had to get that um, removed. So just little stuff like that. You know, we go over every inch of the screen to make sure everything is copacetic, everything is looking good, no mistakes. We're gonna make this thing look fly. I'm a perfectionist about this stuff. And people can feel that. People can feel that. People can feel, okay, this person, they, they took their time out to make this movie good for us. So we don't have a problem paying top dollar to go see this film or to stream this film. We don't have a problem with it. You understand? Professionalism. We gotta start being professional when it comes to each other. We gotta value our people. I value the black audience. I don't look at the black audience as a chitlin circuit because th there's that narrative if you just deal with the black audience, that's the chitlin circuit. That's a very negative connotation. Our money is green like everybody else's money so we can get the same value to the black audience that we do to everybody else. You understand? We have to look at it like that. Now, let's look at the flip side of what I'm talking about, about demanding equal compensation. Let's look at the flip side because there is a flip side, ladies and gentlemen. There is a flip side. 
if you are being compensated, black people, if you are providing goods and services, you need to provide equitable services for what you're being compensated for because we do have things in our society where you're giving certain black folks some money and they're not giving you the proper services that you are paying for. We do have some of that, especially with some of y'all hairdressers out here. Ladies, let me talk to you for a minute because again, like I said, this goes another way. A lot of times what happens is in certain cities, People who do hair are kind of or who do hair properly or who do who does hair professionally. A lot of times they might be far in between. It might be kind of hard to get a good braider. It might be kind of hard to get somebody who can do lace fronts real good. And then what happens is some of these hairdressers will capitalize off the scarcity factor and they'll start overcharging people without giving the best service they can get. That's janky, too. You don't want to do that. Yes, I'm going there, too. Yes. Yes, I'm going there too. Ladies, some of y'all hairdressers are very good at doing that, especially out here in California and Los Angeles because you don't have a lot of good braiders out here because a lot of the black folks in LA and Southern California are so spread out. A lot of people, black folks are spread out, so it's hard to get good braiders and, and hairdressers out here for black women. So a lot of times what they do they be sitting up here overcharging their ass off for janky ass service. Okay, if I do your braids, you're going to have to buy the hair. You're going to have to send me a cash app deposit for gas money. Then you're going to have to send me another 50% deposit. You're going to have to wash your hair and blow dry it ahead of time. You're going to have to buy the hair dye. You're going to have to partially dye your hair. Then what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to put a bang on layaway. And then you're going to have to give me $1,500 when I get there before I get started on your hair. And that type of stuff ain't going to fly either. Okay? That ain't going to fly either. You can't give janky service and then try to be overly compensated. Okay. We got to stop that. That's going to have to stop too. We got to learn how to give equal compensation, equal service. All right. It has to be fair all across the board. <laughs> All right, y'all, that's been today's episode, man. I think we had a, a pretty constructive conversation today. Um, my real estate people are texting me now, so I got some stuff to sign, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm in a very good mood because we're getting this museum popping like we need to get it popping. So I'm very excited about that. Um, look, y'all follow me on um, Instagram, Tariq Elite. Follow me on um, um Twitter, Tariq, Tariq Nasheed. By the way, this Sunday, I might be showing the trailer of the new film. Speaking of the new film, I might be showing the trailer this Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. So you guys subscribe to this channel. If you have not subscribed to the channel, hit that bell notification so that you will be notified. All right. And I'm going to holler at you later on this week. Puppy Akute and Lilla Vuve to the family.